Opportunity once again, you've extended unto us to come to learn and grow as true disciples. Holy Spirit, you're the greatest teacher. And ask that you teach tonight and confirm your word with science following. Father, we lay aside the cares of today, we lay aside the weights of today. We call our minds to be sharp, to be alert, to be attentive, that the information and insight that is being distributed be retained within our faculties, within our spirits, within our hearts that we walk out of here tonight inspired and challenged by the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we thank you and praise you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to welcome all those who are joining us via live stream. Uh, God bless you. Thank you so much for your presence tonight. And also I want to thank those who are here. You know, your sacrifice of time to come to receive, to grow as a believer uh, is to be commended. It really is. And I also want to challenge you and encourage you to make sure you're giving the courses the proper time that they need. You know, for instance, if some of us, if this was a degree from the University of Akron, we would commit a lot of extra time to study. But typically that's because we see that degree possibly taking us somewhere. Amen. And that's one of the double-edged swords to not charging for courses is that many times when there is no fee and it's free, we treat it like that. You know, but these courses that we're taking, when Apostle was in ministry school in the 80s, they paid thousands of dollars a year to receive of the information that we, that just cost us our time. Amen. And so I just challenge and encourage you uh, to make sure you're not just coming to class, but you're going home, setting time aside, set Saturday afternoon aside, or whatever evening or days you have available to go over the information, review the information, because we don't want to just receive and say, I went to class, but we want to make sure it's sticking. We want to make sure that it's a part of us. I learned in higher education there were certain classes uh, that really were going to become a part of your career, a part of your future, a part of your life that you need to know certain things. For instance, a doctor needs to know certain numbers and certain scales and certain measurements and tools. And these are tools that you're going to need to know, amen, for your life. And so I trust that we're taking the time to treat it as such, all right? And so uh, it's a personal challenge to all of us, all right? Not pointing any fingers, didn't hear any bad reports. I just noticed how sometimes when these courses are given, we kind of treat them sometimes as if they're less than when they really aren't, all right? Uh, did anybody take the time to read? We have the instruction to read one through five. Did anybody take the time to actually read? Um, good, thank you. So you should be able to plug right away um, where we're gonna pick up, uh, dealing with chapter three and four. We'll work on those collectively and then that's gonna lead us to chapter five. My assignment as your instructor, for last week and this week was to get us to the conclusion of chapter 5 and I'm going to make sure we fulfill our assignment so that Apostle Parker can pick up next week with chapter 6 but chapter uh, 3 and 4 uh, they couple well together even along with chapter 5 they all really go together they build on top of each other because in these three chapters Dr. Bell begins to reference uh, the, uh, one of the one of the greatest prophets that we know in the text, which is the prophet Elijah. He deals with the relationship of Elisha and Elijah. 
And in chapter 3, I think one of the key points that he begins to, to draw to our attention can be found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 through 28. And in that verse of Scripture, I want to paraphrase because of time, you find where uh, there's a pursuit, a woman has a pursuit for her sons to sit on the side of Jesus, to reign with him. And uh, Jesus has some choice words in response to her request of them wanting to reign with him. As a matter of fact, let's just run over there and look at it. I don't want to assume that we took the time to read this. So uh, in order to appreciate it, I think we should take a moment and run over to Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 through 28. I believe it was the sons of Zebedee, if I'm not mistaken. Matthew 20, verse 20 through 28. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Check your neighbor out, see if they got it, see if they need a little bit of help. Maybe the pages are stuck, maybe the iPad got a glitch in it. Amen. And kind of like Apostle, nothing wrong with technical devices, but I would encourage us, uh, you know, places that you go, not to necessarily reference your phone as your Bible. And the reason being is because while you're studying the Word or you're uh, even in service, the phone is pinging off with all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? That really end up being distractions from your learning. So I encourage you to get a physical Bible or, or use a device that is for a Bible. That, does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. I don't know. Okay. And I say that because as I travel and go places, I see a lot of people use phones. But then I notice if you look at their phone, they're on Instagram, they're on Facebook, they're getting bings about sports games and they're clicking on them while they're in the Word. And it, it can really become a distraction if you're there to grow and learn. Uh, but if that's not your purpose, then by any means. <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 through 28, it says, Then, then the mother of, the Zebed of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. Verse number 21. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? I wish I could preach that, but we don't have time. And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They said to him, we are able, verse 23. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and on my left side is not mine to give. But it is for those who... It is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. Verse number 24. And when, they, and when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are greatly and those who are great exercise authority over them. Verse number 26. Yet it shall not be so among you but whoever desires to become great among you let him be your servant whoever desires to be first among you let him be your slave just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many we see the heart of Jesus and his desire to simply express his passion of being a servant. You see all throughout his ministry, his, his expression of servanthood. That's what Jesus was centered in. He didn't come to be served. And I think that that's amazing because if there was anybody who was deserving to be served, it was him. But he changes gears and let them know, listen, it's not about being served, but it's about being the servant. Because the servant is the one who is the greatest in the kingdom. It's the chief in the kingdom, and that's the servant. And all of us, as we should have remembered from last week, we all have that assignment to serve. We looked at that through the text, that all are not called to be apostles, all are not called to be pastors, and so forth and so on, but all are called to serve. That's a call that we all have. And he goes on, Dr. Bell goes on in, in this chapter, and he picks up talking about Elisha. Elijah and Elisha. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. And I have a few, we're going to jump into a little bit of dialogue tonight. I think dialogue is essential in learning when it challenges us to think, it challenges us to prepare words 
Um, I think that that is an essential tool to be able to grow and to learn. And so we're going to have try to create time for some dialogue tonight. Uh, but First Kings chapter number 19, verse number 16, and Dr. Bill begins to talk about sticking to our decisions. Sticking to our decisions. First Kings 19, verse number 16. First Kings 19, verse 16, we'll read through verse number 21. First Kings 19, verse, verse number 16 through 21. It says, also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Seraphat, of Abel, Mahaloah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Verse number 17, it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all who, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Verse number 19, so he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat who was plowing with the 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elijah turned back from him took the yoke off of the oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Wow. I think one of the things that's interesting in the Bible is that we don't tie into play their humanity. We just see them as Bible characters like we're watching a Lifetime movie. But this isn't entertainment. This is real life. And I think one, what's a powerful tool that we talked about last week, if you remember, we talked about those being called to, uh, to serve and those being appointed and God elevating individuals that you found that those who God used to elevate were already in the middle of doing what? Serving. And here we find what's happening with Elijah. Elijah wasn't begging to become the king Elijah Elisha was in the middle of doing what serving <laughs> he's just minding his business tending to the fields and uh, God calls Elijah to go up to him to place the mantle on him and with that mantle being placed on him God says this is going to be your su successor this is the man that's going to serve you I'm giving Elisha the call to come serve you now what's interesting is that you don't see a relationship between Elijah and Elisha can you imagine if you were at your job tomorrow, some, we all work in different places, but somebody just comes up to you in the middle of their job and places a mantle on you and said, God called me, called you to serve me, let's go. I think it's safe to say a lot of us women are like, I'm not going anywhere, uh, have a great day, I don't know what your problem is, but this is what really happens. This is what really happens. And he places that mantle on him to serve him. But what's interesting is that we see a type and shadow that we find in the Gospels. Does anybody see that type and shadow that's in the Gospels here in these verses of Scripture? Can anybody, anybody identify the types and shadows? Go ahead. Okay. Absolutely. That is one type of shadow. That's not necessarily the one I'm looking for, but that is one. Uh, there's another hand up. Your hand was up, I believe, Mr. Ackland. I see the one, the shadow that I see is that um, when he told individuals that they wanted to go first and do something else, mm -hmm. and then said they wasn't worthy. But here, the prophet tells him to go. In other words, you got to know that it's not just me calling you. But that God has given that to you. He put that mantle on him, and he came afterwards. Yeah, that, that's, that's the direction that I was going in. What you find is that uh, for the second time, we're going to keep going because he kind of uh, gave insight to it. What you find here is a type and shadow of what you see, and I believe it's Luke 7. I think it's either Luke 7 or Luke 9, where there were men who wanted to follow after Jesus. 
And when they came to Jesus and said, well, we want to follow you. And he says, okay, well, let's go. And they said, but first, what? I have to go. I have to go tend to some natural things. And here is what Elisha is saying. I, I'm willing to pick up this man because I guarantee you Elisha probably heard about Elijah. There had to be uproar and conversation about, man, this prophet Elijah is bad, man. This dude will shut up the heavens and cause rain to flow. So there had to be some form, I would imagine, some form of an insight of who Elijah was. But nevertheless, time and opportunity came, and Elijah's, Elisha's response was a lot of times just like our responses. Like, I want God, but I need to do me first. I need to do what my plans are first. I need to tend to what he's asking for, in my opinion, is not unreasonable. He's just saying, let me go say bye to my mom. Let me go say bye to my dad. And Elisha said, okay, well, you have a decision to make. If you boil down what he's saying, he's saying, you can go do that, or you can follow me, make your mind up. So he was called to the carpet right there in that moment. And I believe that there are moments in all of our lives where God is calling us to the carpet. Well, you're going to have to make your mind up. This is why Dr. Bell starts to talk about in this chapter, make a decision. If God is going to be God, I'm going to follow him, then so be it. If not, then don't. Why are we trying to do both at the same time? And this is where we get the convenience of servanthood, the convenience of surrendering in ministry, because many times it's not going to be convenient. And what you find here, I love this symmetry between this and, 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 and in the book of Luke, you find the symmetry of both men wanting to follow, but they still want to do their thing first. And some of us right now are in that same space right now in our lives personally, if we were to be honest. Like, I want to serve God, I want to follow God, but there are things I'm not willing to let go of. There are plans that I'm not willing to let go of. There are agendas that I'm not willing to let go of. But in order to come drink of this cup and in order to come experience what Elijah's talking about here, he said, you got to let that stuff go. And so that's a personal challenge to all of us because in everybody's life, there's going to be what is called a defining moment. Which path am I going to take? A defining moment. What you find was interesting, um, we were in a memorial service today, and there was, many of you know Mother Giddings, she would come and usually sit, if I'm facing the audience, she was usually on the right side. Uh, she lived to be around, I think, 94, 95, somewhere around that, it's 90, around almost 95 years old. And they were, uh, the pastor from the church that she was a part of previously came and shared, and she was a part of that church for 70 years and served as the children's minister, one of the children's teachers, as well as a deaconess until she couldn't no more. Now that's just the lost art in the culture that we live in today. Because we get led by God every six months, some of us nine months, 12 months, 18 months, two years. Three. I just feel like God is leading me. But see, the hard thing in that is it's hard for fruit to grow. See, when we're shifty, it's hard for anything to really grow, anything to really take on form, because for it to grow, and number one, it's going to be a planning. It's going to be a season of toiling that ground. It's going to be a season of getting my hands dirty. It's going to be a season of shaping and molding and bending. And many times we give up when we haven't even gotten to the real game yet. And then we, we utilize phrases where I just feel God is leading me or my season is shifting. It's a turning in my, my season, and God is calling me. And, and my heart goes out because I, one thing that I learned is that in order for God to build anything, a man or woman must be found faithful in what God places in their hands. This is why we talked about last week, Dr. Bell referenced being appointed. What has God appointed you to, and how are we handling or managing that appointment? What I love here also we find in, in 1 Kings chapter um, chapter 19 is that as God calls Elisha, God doesn't change his mind. And I think that's something in some of our hearts I want to encourage you to settle in. God doesn't change his mind. You can change your mind because he's given us that free will. He's given us that desire. You know, I can wake up tomorrow and be like, I'm out of here. I'm selling everything I have. I'm buying a beach house in Costa Rica. 
and I'm going to open up a coffee shop and I'm going to have Sunday service on the beach. I can do that. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. Because I have that free will. But that doesn't mean that's what God has called me to do in this season. I pray that there is coming a season where I will be having my beach house in Costa Rica and I'm going to wear a swimsuit every day and go soar fish, spear fishing and, and just live on the, on the ocean. I believe that day is going to come, but it's not right now. But we have our free will, and I think many times because we won't become one with God's will, we keep trying to, we keep butting our heads as, as, a Paul, as, God, as God spoke to Paul or, or the Lord spoke to Paul, why are we kicking against the goads? And here's what I've discovered in life. No matter how hard you kick, his plan ain't going to change. His purpose ain't going to change. What he's called you to do, it's not going to change. His assignment for your life is not going to change. God's not going to say, you know what? You tired of being a cell phone? Let's just turn you. We're just going to turn you into a, a couch. It's not going to happen. You tired of being a car? Well, you know, we're just going to turn you into a remote control. That's not going to happen. This is why I always encourage you, just embrace whatever his assignment is. Embrace whatever his call is because the scripture lets us know that when we become trees, what? Planted by the rivers of living water, that there's fruit that's going to come forth. But those fruit, that fruit will never come forth if, unless we remain planted. And I have grown up in the things of God, and it seems many times like God's word is not true, but his word is true. But here's where you see fruit in the lives of people who are planted. I have never, I have seen some of the most gifted people, anointed people, called people, even that came through this ministry, called, anointed, gifted, can prophesy, can sing, can dance, can articulate the word of God, very little fruit. And it's not because they're not gifted. Because they just won't be planted. So they have glimpses of fruit. They have little, there might be a, a patch here and there. It might be a season of a good harvest every now and then. But they never get to experience the fullness of what God meant for them to experience because they won't remain planted. And so I'm challenging us tonight, what Dr. Bell is talking about, is making a decision and remain planted in whatever that call is that he has for your life. And that's between you and the Lord. But here's what I can tell you for sure. He's not calling you to something new every six months. Why would he do that? Why would a loving God, a wonderful Savior, who created you from the foundation of the world for a specific purpose and task, keep shifting you around? That doesn't even sound like God. So where is the, wherever there is the resistance, what I'm saying is, is that you'll experience the peace of God the more you just say, God, I'm going to yield. And whatever that looks like, I trust you. Whatever the future brings concerning it, I trust you. This is why trust is so important. And what I've learned, and this is something I had to grow in even personally as an individual, you can be strong in faith, but we can trust. See, strong in faith means I can stand on the word. I can quote the word. I can get my Bible verses and have my vision board on, my, on, the, on, on the refrigerator and I stand there and I declare according to Mark eleven twenty four, 24, whatever things I desire, when I pray, believe, I receive them and I shall have them. I, I mean, I can do that by faith. I walk by faith and not by sight. I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his mind. I lean not to my own understanding. In all my ways, I acknowledge him and he direct my path. See, I can be strong in that. But we can trust at the same time. How is that possible? Because faith is a gift. It's a byproduct of the spirit. You've been given the measure of faith. But trust is not a byproduct of the spirit. Trust is a byproduct of a relationship. And there are many who are strong in faith, but we can trust. Because trust is going to reflect the relationship because every relationship hinges on the word trust. And you can't trust a God that you don't know. This is why some of us got the backup plans and this is why some of us, well, he ain't come through so I'm just going, you didn't really trust it.
And see, it's in the journey that the trust is built. It's in the learning God that the trust is built. David had trust in God. This is why he ran after Goliath, not because he was just strong in faith. He had trust in God. Where did that trust come from? That trust came from the lion and the bear. That built his trust. And there are things in your journey where God is just building the trust. Why? Because there's going to be some Goliaths that you're going to stand before that unless that trust is built, your ability to endure and persevere is going to be limited because you haven't got to learn or know God in that space. And so there are things right now, I guarantee you by the Spirit of God, there are things in your life right now that God is utilizing to cultivate trust. Why? Because in order to receive and expand in the dimensions of the revelations of God, it's going to come by way of experience. So in other words, there are many here who are, if they are facing battles within their physical anatomy, they know God as Jehovah Rapha. He's my healer, and I'm confident in that because I've needed to be healed before, and he's done it. But do I really know him as Jehovah Shammah? the God of peace. Because if I did, I probably wouldn't be up all night worrying. Did they call you yet? Did they get in yet? See, there are revelations and dimensions of God that will grow, that all will trace back to trust. And so what we find here is that Elisha was called to Elijah. He called him. And we find what we discover in 2 Kings 2, verse 10. You can write this down. Um, Dr. Bell begins to talk about this. We see the reference point of Elijah communicating to Elisha where repetitively he is trying to dismiss him from his assignment. And there are three times where Elijah is giving him the instruction, just go ahead. I don't need you anymore. It's fine. I, I threw in, I don't need you anymore. But he says, go ahead. He tells him to go to a different city, go to a different place. And Elisha says, no way, I'm sticking by your side. Because he's making a request that he wants a double portion of that mantle. So what Elijah says, well, if you see me when I go, what does that mean? What that in, one of the interpretations of that implies is that wherever I am, there you must be also. So Elisha was pressing for the mantle that was on Elijah. And so in 2 Kings 10, he said, if you see, he, he draw, we see where he draws close to him. But through that closeness, we see that Elisha follows and serves Elijah for six years. Six years. They did life together. Not Sunday service for six years. Not prayer meetings for six years. Not Bible study for six years. Not small groups for six years. Not church for six years. Not counseling sessions for six years. They did life together for six years. Wherever you go, I'm with you. So Elisha got to experience a lot of things walking with Elijah. And see, and there are people that God will bring into your life. There are ministers, there are leaders that God will bring into your life that are giving you exposure to where he's taking you. And if we begin to see people sometimes the right way, we can receive them the right way because you can never receive right what you don't see right. So if you don't see and perceive a person the right way, you'll never receive them the right way. This is why when Jesus returned to his hometown, and his Bible said he could have did great works, but he left. Why? They didn't see him the right way. I kind of know what that feels like to a degree. Because among a lot of people, they just see me. That's Joshua. I remember him when he was a little boy. I was that little boy, but I'm not that little boy anymore. I'm not that child anymore. I was him. And yes, we had great memories. And not that I have arrived, not that I'm above or anything like that, but I'm not him anymore. But when that's how they see you, they'll never receive of the anointing on your life. 
because they don't see you like that. So the words that you speak, they're not, they're not taken and harnessed because that's just Josh. I remember him. He would run around the church. Him and William would go and tear stuff up, and they would get in trouble. He was such a good little boy. And that's okay because you can't force people to see you the way God has designed you to be. That's quite all right. But here's what you'll find is that the reception is not the same. And Jesus ran into that because they didn't see him right. And so Elijah walks with Elisha, and he's there serving him for six years. And what's amazing is that the mantle on Elisha was stronger than that that was with on Elijah. He did greater miracles. But what's profound is that even though he did greater miracles, he utilized the same systems of Elijah. That's the powerful part. Then what that shows is that he received of the impartation. So, for instance, in, in, when Elijah, remember, it talks about uh, the woman, the widow woman. He goes to the house after he declares there's going to be a drought. He goes to the house and he said, what do you have in your house? He took what she had and what did he do? He multiplied it. And if you keep reading, Elisha does the same thing. He goes to the house. The woman and her sons are about to die. What does he do? Well, what do you got in your house? He takes it. He multiplies it. There was a young man who dies and when Elijah's ministry, he goes into the house, goes into the room, shuts the door, lays on top of the sun. The sun comes alive. Elisha and his ministry runs into the same problem. There's a young man that dies. What does Elijah do? He didn't have to figure it out. He just traced the steps of Elijah. See, this is why God will connect you to anointings. You ain't got to figure it out. Just trace the steps of Elijah. Just trace the steps of the mantles that God brings into your life. And when you're submitted to the mantle, you'll see the flow of that mantle flow just like it flowed through them. When Apostle moved to Los Angeles, there was so much fear inside of me. Not fear in my ability to articulate the word, but I wanted to see, I need to see the demonstration the same way. I need to see that when hands are laid, that there's healings the same way. I need to see people are getting filled with the Holy Spirit the same way. We're not, we have different styles, that's clear, and that's okay. God's going to use you where you are. But I needed to see the same mantle in operation. And the first Sunday, I'm up ministering. I said, the man that walks in, I shared this story, I think, last week. I'm not sure if I did or not. But many of you heard this story. I'm walking in. A young man is walking in in the center of the, the church in the front entry there under the awning. I'm walking on the side by where the offices are. And I see him hobbling as he's walking in. And I said, God's going to heal you today. And I just kept walking. I'm like, oh, my God, what am I saying? You make a bold statement like that, something, something got to happen. Maybe that's sometimes why we don't want to say nothing because we don't want to put God on the carpet. Something's going to have to happen. Maybe that's why we don't, when we see people at work sick, we don't want to say God's going to heal you because then he's going to have to heal them. But God loves to be put on the spot. And at the end of service, sure enough, we made an altar call for those who are sick to come to the front. And he comes to the altar. And I said, okay, God, in my mind, I'm thinking, here we go. Let's get this show on the road. We're going to we're gonna find out if this thing is real or not. And I walk over to the young man. I lay hands on him and Boom, the anointing of God hits his body. He begins to sweat profusely. He gets up after being slain in the spirit, goes out. He leaves. I'm like, man, I don't know what happened. I don't know if he's okay, if he got worse. Did he get better? I don't know. But I want to know. Long story short, comes back at the end of service and said, Pastor, the reason why I was hobbling the way I was was because I was, I'm wearing a catheter. I've been wearing a catheter for weeks now. And the doctor said they're going to have to do surgery to fix the problem. But when you prayed for me, the power of God hit my body. I went to the restroom. I was able to urinate for the first time. And everything that was stopping my flow came out of me. He goes to the doctor. The doctor says, well, we need to put that back in as a precaution. He never put it in and never had to have a procedure concerning that issue again. God healed his body. What happened? Just walking in the mantle. Apostle spends time in prayer. I make sure I spend time in prayer. 
Apostle gets down on his knees and he quotes Ephesians chapter 3 before he goes out to minister. I get down on my knees. I quote Ephesians chapter 3 before I go out to minister. There are things if you tap into the mantle, you don't have to reproduce the anointing. It's already set. You just trace the picture. You don't have to be frustrated to try to draw a picture. Just trace a picture. And if you trace that picture, that anointing is going to go with you wherever you go. Oh, man. Let's keep going. So we see in their his ministry that the mantle transfers, but Elisha never wavers in his decision to follow Elijah. Never wavers. And there are times where we waver in our decisions. There are times where we're tempted beyond our de- to, to step outside of our commitments. I can't tell you how many times temptations have come to step to pull me outside of my commitments. Sometimes it'll be with little things. Remember being a youth pastor, and then we might have a special event planned, and I might get a call. I'll never forget, I got a call. Uh, pastor Chad couldn't be there. He, they needed some help with the Pittsburgh Steelers. He said, hey, man, it's an opportunity to go be with the team and travel and do all these things. And I said, oh, man, that'd be great. But I got to go take some kids to volunteer. Can't do it. Great opportunity. Possibly once in a lifetime. Fortunately, they used me more, but nevertheless, I had to say no. See, there are things that's going to challenge your decision. And it seems like the enemy always knows when to come at the right time. There'll be times I love Apostle, I love Dr. Barbie, but sometimes working with family and working together can be challenging in and of itself. And we don't always see eye to eye. Especially as you begin to grow and mature, you know, your voice gets a little stronger and you start to see things the way you see them. And it never fails that many times whenever we're at a point where it's like, man, listen, something's going to have to give. Here comes an opportunity. Here's an escape for you. But see, if I'm not seeing my position right, I would be thinking, oh, here's, here's a God thing. God is creating an escape for me. That's not what he's called me to. And there would be things, I'm telling you these stories not to draw attention to myself. I'm using illustration because there are going to be stories in your life where you're going to be tested on what God has called you to do. In every angle. Even financially, I recall uh, when, uh, when I started working in the ministry, um, when I initially came on staff in the ministry, you know, everything was well, everything was good. You know, I had the business going in ministry, eventually was sold the business, was doing full-time ministry, and the ministry hit a place where they said, listen, we, we can't afford you. I still got to eat. <laughs> Maybe you don't. I mean, I, I, I eat natural food, not just spiritual food, just like you. I still want to enjoy life. There are things I still desire to buy, to accomplish, to build. And they said, we can't afford you. And so I had to seek God on what to do. And God told me, no, you stay right there. Well, God, how am I going to stay right here? They can't afford me. So I worked six years pro bono. Six years. Went through Christmases, couldn't tell my family nothing other than I love you. Merry Christmas. I'm serving God. And seeing the eyes of others, nobody knew that. Everything I had was coming by faith. So when I talk about, I I know toils and struggles and pains, I I know what I'm talking about. And you deal with all kind of hardship and attitudes, and you're like, listen, I ain't getting paid for this. But people have the perception, they think, well, you're just doing it. because No, all out of my heart. But in the meantime, while this is happening, I'm turning down six-figure opportunities. 
Six figures ain't nothing to shy over, in my opinion. I mean, it ain't seven, but it sure ain't two or three. Then where I was, four figures sounded good to me. <laughs> Anything with a four figures in it. Why am I turning it down? Not because I didn't have needs. Every times I'm crying myself to sleep because I'm seeing my friends who I went to school with and got their degrees and they're just going out buying houses and, and, and having families and all this stuff and the toil and anguish is going on inside of me and I'm much more qualified and equipped and more of an asset than they are. Not to try to put them down, but the truth is the truth. God's gifted me in a lot of ways. But I didn't waver in my decision. And I'm challenging you tonight. There are going to be things that will knock against the call. There are going to be things that will knock against what God has called you to do. But will you stay rooted in your decision? Then God began to increase and the, the rest was history. You know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm okay now. Shoot. I'm all right. I mean, I ain't where I, I, I desire to be, but I, I'm in more than enough. And so I thank God for that. Every need is met above and beyond. And God, and that's one thing I love about God is a good paymaster. God will accelerate you. After that thing broke and some business deals broke in my life, man, I ended up in the neighborhood I always desired to be in. As a boy, I would ride through and say, one day I'm going to live over here. And see how God just whoop supernaturally. You ain't losing nothing serving God. See, God will get you to where you need to be without toil. It just ain't going to look the way you thought it was going to look many times. You thought you was going to get the four by doing two plus two. And God is saying, no, I got a formula that's going to get you the four where you're going to have to use the, uh, the tool. Please excuse my dear, your dear Aunt Sally. Use parentheses. X. Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about, math scholars. We're going to be multiplying, dividing, subtracting. We're going to be using times tables. We're going to be using uh, pi and all this stuff. We're still going to get the four, but it ain't going to look the way you thought it was going to look many times. But will you stay rooted in your decision? That's the question. And it's not a rooting of uh, staying rooted to man. It's saying, I'm staying rooted because, God, I believe this is of you. Let's, I want to throw out a question because I kind of shared about where I was in some things. But how do you stay rooted in your decisions? Some of you, your decision to follow God. How do you stay rooted when you feel like throwing in the towel, when you feel like giving up, when you feel like, here's what my ultimate decision was, the reason why, what enabled me to stay rooted and what still equips me to stay rooted, I can't live wondering what it would have been like had I stayed faithful. That's my Achilles heel right there. I, Joshua can't live wondering what it would have been like had he just stayed faithful. That's my trick. That's my tool. Does anybody else have a tool that they use that helps them? Go ahead. Uh, I've never finished anything in life. Mm-hmm. I didn't finish college. Excuse me. I didn't finish uh I had scholarships for football. I didn't finish that. Yeah. I didn't finish um, the Marine Corps. I had four years. I only did two. Mm -hmm. I've never finished. I had a brother that told me, he said, man, you don't finish nothing. Hmm. And the thing that keeps me going is like when Peter, he asked Peter them, he said, will you also go away? They said, Lord, where are we going to go? You got the gifts of eternal life. Mm. Ain't nothing else ever worked for me. And I know that my life is planted in this right here. Yeah. Even when I try, I heard apostle said, anybody's got a call on your life, it'll keep calling. Yeah. It'll never. And even in my mess, I couldn't help but talk about him. Scared a lot of people. Mm. Thought I was crazy. But that's something from a child, experiences and stuff I had when I look back. He's been there all the time, and I can't deny it. Mm -hmm. 
that's what keeps me going. Okay. I know that that's anything else yeah. is useless. This is my life. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? What 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 keeps you rooted? Hey man, we got some oh. hands over here. Oh, somebody over here. What keeps you rooted? I pray that for some of us who who need help in this area, pull on some of these responses that we're hearing. What what keeps you rooted? My thought is always I don't want to get to heaven and have and be ashamed because I didn't do what he asked me to do. Hmm. I want to get that crown. I've always finished everything I started. I, the college thing, everything I start, I finish. But I don't want to be the only one without a crown, for instance. I don't want to be the only one where he, he, he's not even saying, my good and faithful servant, I'm just walking in because, you know, like going by the, you know what I mean, just barely making it. I don't want that. I don't want to be ashamed. Yeah. I want him to look at me and say, I am so proud of you. You did a good job. I'm so happy for everything you've done. I've asked you to do and you did it. Yeah. I want that. Hmm. That's what keeps me going in everything I do. Wow. Amen. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> um, I think one of the main things that kept me going through the different trials and situations in my life is, is family. Because I realized early that God had placed me in, in a, a, a serious position. And having a wife and having children, it was important for me when I got saved that my first thing I wanted to do was make sure they got saved. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go to heaven and they're not there. But the main thing was that, you know, I wanted to be that example. So I can't quit. Mm -hmm. I feel like if I would have quit a long time ago, if I would have quit when things got rough, then what would leave them? What would happen to them? Mm -hmm. How would God use me as an example if I quit? Mm -hmm. So it was really important for me to still be that example, to get up and do the things that God told me to do, to get up and go to work, get up and take care of all kinds of business and everything else, just to be that person in my family so that God can get the glory, but at the same time that they, my family would see God in me and be and continue to do even when times get hard. Amen. Thank you. We'll do two more and then we'll stop. Right there. Thank you. Good <laughs> share. One here and then one back there. No. In Matthew nineteen twenty nine, it says, "Anyone who, anyone and everyone who left houses, brothers, sisters, fathers, mother, children, for my sake, will receive a hundredfold times more and inherit eternal life." I had to give up everything. Hmm. It didn't take all that. It don't take all that. You know, it don't. You know, and I had to make a choice. Me and my kids. Mm -hmm. And he's faithful. Mm -hmm. And it was worth everything I had to give up. Wow. I had been on my job. My mom worked there. My ex-husband worked there. Some of my relatives worked there. And they thought I was done lost my mind. Mm -hmm. But God. Mm -hmm. And he's faithful. Wow. Thank you. Uh, this is in, in, encouraging because we all have our moments. We all have times where te temptations, tests, and trials hit all of us. Um, the thing that kept me faithful through all these years that I had been saved is that I knew that Jesus loved me with everlasting love. And all my life, I never had the right people, the people that should have loved me, love me. And I always felt his love. And I, I said, how can I turn my back on somebody that loves me so much that they gave their life for me? And it's, it's not, I know he did it for the world, but it, to me, it's for me. Mm -hmm. It's so personal. And that's what keeps me faithful is the love that God, that I know that Jesus loved me with an everlasting love. 
And he never turns his back on me, even if I mess it up. He doesn't turn his back on me. He chastises me, but he chastises whom he loves, who belongs to him. Man, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, one more. We're going to stop. I, I want to say this. Um, the reason I stick with the process is because I knew God had an assignment on my life. And... I stay committed to it, and over time, I begin to be more accepting of it. And then also, I learned that if you want to be what God wants you to be, you have to stay in the process. And, and, and while other people, a lot of people I know, they became doctors, lawyers, judges, and I felt kind of kind of embarrassed, you know, because they see me as smarter than them, but God had a call on my life for full-time ministry is what a lot of people don't know. So I stayed in the process, but I didn't know how long the process was going to take. But I stay in it because, number one, we don't know how long we're going to be on the earth. And number two, you can't bypass God's process. I know a lot of people call. He can't bring them into being pastors. He can't bring them into it because they uprooted they self. Mm-hmm. Because they wouldn't stay under. Yeah. See, I learned that a long time ago through spiritual protocol back in 95, and I learned about the process. You can't become what God wants you to be your way. You got to let him empty you out and, and process you the way he want to process you. And I had to go through, oh, he ain't got no ambition. What he got that degree for? Not knowing that God going to send me out the oversight of work. But they don't see that. No. You see what I'm saying? So I had to walk through humility. What is humility? Inward humiliation where you feel humiliated because you ain't got the money. You ain't, but, when, but it's a whole di- But the thing is, it ain't about what people think. It's about God's process. And, and I, like I said, a lot of people want to find another way to get to where they want to go. But they interrupted their process, and God's not going to give them some new course to get there. And I learned you can't waste time. You got to stay with what God because he has a process. And then number two, as I get older, I realize you don't know how long you're going to (laughs) live. I I mean, uh, because a lot of people never go from being called to being chosen. That's true. Because they get offended and they they interrupt their own process. So that's all I had to say. I went over my three minutes. (laughs) No, but thank you for sharing that because that gives segue into chapter five. You know, because chapter five, um, let's start journeying through that. Though put, putting notes to the thoughts of chapter five will pull out the big ideas. Chapter five deals with being shaped and molded. It deals with your my faithfulness. And what we found through Elisha is that his serving Elijah began to shape him and mold him. And what Dr. Bell references throughout chapter 5 is that we cannot shape and mold ourselves. And that totally contradicts the culture of, of, of this generation. Like, I can do it by myself. I'm good. Let me just get a self-help CD or a self-help audio download. Like, I am good all by myself. And everything around you testifies you're not but for whatever reason, your mirror is like extra dirty where you think you are. But, but, but God uses things around us to help shape us, to help mold us. And, and nobody gets to where God has called them to be in their own strength and ability. You know, I was talking about tracing the lines. And with Apostle Parker, all he did was trace the lines of Apostle Frederick K.C. Price. That was all he did. And so the same results that Apostle Frederick Casey Price saw are the same results Apostle Parker saw. And he was so encouraged. Many of you know that they wanted him to take over their, their church there in New York City. And when they brought him in for interviewing, they're like, oh my gosh, you're just like Apostle Price. You're like the same person. That wasn't because they're going to coffee, they're going to dinner, they're going to lunch and just hanging out. And no, he just following examples. He followed the patterns of the man and saw the same things in his life. 
And if you don't have leadership in your life that you're willing to submit to and follow and trace, I encourage you to believe God to connect you to leadership that you will submit to and receive from and trace because you don't have to recreate the wheel. Elisha didn't recreate the wheel. Joshua didn't recreate the wheel. The disciples didn't recreate the wheel. Paul didn't recreate the wheel. Peter didn't recreate the wheel. They just followed the pattern. And if we're honest in our lives, every place we miss it, we break the pattern. And we can blame it on a lot of things, a lot of people. Well, you don't understand. You don't No, you broke the pattern. The pattern of your prayer time, the pattern of your word time. One of my favorite movies, American Gangster, Frank Lucas, breaks the pattern. He knew not to wear loud clothes. Loud clothes get attention. Falls in love with the woman from Puerto Rico. Nothing wrong with Puerto Ricans, but falling in love with the woman from Puerto Rico. She buys him the chinchilla coat. Boom. Where did this man get this chinchilla coat from? Broke his pattern. Turns into this downfall. And many of us, our downfall is not the coat, but we find areas in our life where we break the pattern. The pattern works. It works if you work it. Just like the seed of the word of God. And I love what, uh, I want to go to Galatians chapter 6 here as we journey through chapter 5. Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> because Elisha didn't have guarantees of anything. He didn't have any guarantees. Many times God will just show us glimpses. He'll show us just glimpses that help keep us engaged. And there are times in my life, I don't even know why I'm sharing this, but I'm like, God, I just need a glimpse right now. I just need a flash in some way, some form, that this is of you. And God will do that. He will keep you encouraged to keep you in the game. But here's the thing, don't ignore those encouragements. i never forget I was at a place... Uh, I don't know if it was before I became, became senior pastor. And I'm like, I am over this. I'm just going to be honest. I am over this. And I'm ready to call it a, a game. You know what I'm saying? I'm never going to stop serving God, but it's time for something to move. You understand what I'm saying? And so I, I had put together in my mind how I was going to, you know, step away from uh, pastoral duties and assistant pastor to apostle at that time. And while I'm wrestling with this in my mind, I'm at the gym and I'm working out. And this guy walks up to me. Remember, we had services on uh, Cleveland, Massillon Road, the church that had the orange awnings. We were having services there, and he would come. All right, this was several years later, probably eight to ten years later. And I'm just exercising. This guy comes up while I'm exercising. Now, I'm in the battle of, I'm in the valley of decisions here. And see, God will use people, but you can't ignore what he sends to bring confirmation. And sometimes we just dismiss it and get right back into our emotions and right back into our feelings. Well, yeah, I know they came and told me this, but I still feel this way. No, you got to learn how to hear the voice of God. Amen. And when we tripping on our internal hearing, God is going to send some external hearing, some external voices. And I'm there working out. And he says, Pastor Joshua, you don't remember me? He's an older Caucasian man. He said, you might not remember me, but I would visit your church when you were on Cleveland Massillon Road. And I'll never forget, you did a series of teaching called Vision. And he began to regurgitate the messages. And he shared with me how through those messages, he said, I went home, I prayed about it, me and the wife, and I quit my job. And I pursued the vision that God gave me. He says, I'm making more money than I've ever made before. My life is more fulfilled than it's ever been before. And I've been hoping to see you just so that I can let you know how, how much impact you had on reshaping my, my life and my family's life. Thank you so much. I ain't never seen this. I've been going to this gym since I was 12 years old. But why did he happen to be there working out the time I'm in the valley of decision comes up to me, reminds me of a message. I couldn't even regurgitate the message on vision outside of her back in chapter 2, verse number 2, but he is firing off these verses of scriptures that he has meditated on, applied the word to his life, and is seeing the fruit, and that kept me in the game. 
Now, so many times God does that, and we just keep going like we didn't get affirmed. See, sometimes the affirmation won't agree with your feelings. This is why we walk by faith, not by sight. Your feelings won't always agree. How do we know that? Jesus' feelings didn't always agree. What do you mean his feelings didn't always agree? Because he said, he, Lord, I'm ready to pray for a legion of angels to come. Lord, if there be your will, please let this cup pass from me. His feelings weren't in agreement. And there's going to be times in helps and in serving that your feelings are not going to be in agreement. This is why it's so imperative to have a prayer life. Why it's so imperative to have a word life. Why it's so imperative to listen to the word of God. With technology, it's so easy now. Just go, log on to YouTube while you're driving in your car. Most of our cars sync up automatically. Just put on the message. Feed your spirit, man. And I'm telling you, I know this is something I know. Some things I know, but this I know. There's no way you can walk around deficient when you're sowing to your spirit. It's not possible. The reason why you're deficient and the reason why you're in the valley and the reason why you're woe is me and the reason why you don't feel like it, and the reason why you're so tired and the reason why you're drained and the reason why you're this and the reason why you're that and the reason why you're this because you ain't got no prayer life, you ain't got no word life, you ain't sowing to the spirit, you're not building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in other tongues. You're not doing it. It's not possible. It's not possible to be renewed in your spirit daily and be depressed and sad and down and, and I don't feel like it and, and emotional. No, it's not possible. Galatians chapter 6, verse number in 7. Okay, Josh, you're beating a dead horse. Let's keep going. Galatians numbers. I guess when I, I, I don't want to just give you insight from the text. I want to give you some realities of what you deal with. And here's what I want you to know. This never stops. <laughs> you don't reach a point where you get so fulfilled that temptations and realities of life are going to stop knocking at your door. I've discovered that sitting down with some men of God who have helped mentor me. I mean, these guys, from a physical point of view, they could desire nothing. 20,000 members, jets, helicopters, first class everything. And you sit down, talk to them, they're like, man. And in my mind, I'm like, we can trade places real quick. <laughs> I would rather have your problems than my problems. But what I realize, no matter how high you go, you, do, you can't escape the emotions and the feelings and the fatigue. This is why you have to spend time in prayer. You must spend time in the word. You must spend time listening to the word. Because there's always going to be something to combat. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7 through 8. I love this reference of scripture, which really brings encouragement to us. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 8. It reads this. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap whatever a man sows that he will also reap how does that impact me and helps whatever I am sowing I am legally entitled to receive it back oh man you got to know that for some of you, there are visions, there are dreams that God has given you, things he's called you to build, and you know you need the help. This is why I, two, about a year and a half ago, if you remember, I was teaching on the Bible study, and I encouraged you, but I said, start sowing what you want to see happen. And I wasn't talking about money. I was talking about your life. I was talking about your time. I was talking about the investment of your energy. And there were things that I knew this ministry needed, so I started sowing the seed of my time into other people who needed things. And I said, how can I help you with your vision? How can I help you with your dreams? No strings attached. I don't want nothing from you other than the opportunity. I just want to see you win. How can I get into your game to help you win? 
And as I did that, now you see the harvest of a Chad Johnson who says, you know what, I got a few months free. I want to come so into this ministry to help take it where it needs to go. You get Gregory Solano from Miami who says, Pastor, God is waking me up in the middle of the night dealing with my heart about this ministry. I'm supposed to sow my gifts into this ministry. Yes, you are. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That didn't just happen. See, I sowed that, and I want to encourage you. Some of you have been sowing some things. You have to know legally you have the right to receive that. And God will bring that into your life. Don't think you can't. God will give you visions and dreams, but God will use you to help build another man's visions or dreams. He'll use you in another vineyard. But that doesn't mean he won't have a vineyard for you as well. You know, with Apostle, I just wanted to see the dreams in his heart come to fruition. I just wanted to see the purpose and what God had called him into ministry come to fruition. That's it. That's all I ever wanted out of all of this. I wasn't trying to become a pastor. I was trying to run from being a pastor. That wasn't my goal, my ambition. I just wanted to see what God put inside of that man of God go as far as it possibly can go, touch as many people as it could possibly touch. Which is why I'm getting ready to set up an appointment with him and say, Apostle, where do you need me in 2023? Because it's about helping to fulfill your vision. But here's what's happening on the flip side. God is in return now touching the heart saying, Josh, what do you need? See, it's a seed of principle. I never forget. He probably won't want me to share this, but that's okay. When I began pastoring, I said, God, I need somebody to walk with me. Where's my Elisha? Where's my Joshua? I, I, I need help. And I could have just went and asked somebody, will you help me? And they would have done it. I know they would have done it because their hearts are set to please God. But God, I need a divine connection that is you that will carry me and serve me the way I serve apostle. That is out of the heart, not out of assignment base, but I know I'm called to walk with you. And while I'm praying this and believing God for this, about a year goes by, and here comes Troy Roebuck. I got to set a meeting with you. And he comes and shares. I said, that's God. Using my spirit all along, but I had to wait for God to put it in your spirit. And so as I was challenged to pursue and move to different places, and I held to the call, Troy comes in. He says, Pastor, but I just want you to know I have a five-year plan. And in five years, my family and I were moving to such and such, and, but I'm here with you until that point. I'm like, well, okay. Then about a year, a year ago, he comes in and says, you know what, God is dealing with my heart. I'm not going anywhere. God told me I can't leave your side. That I and my family and I are with you wherever you go. Restructuring this whole life, and I'm humbled. I don't know how to receive it. And God is showing me, you did the same thing for your father. See, God will call, you will reap whatever you sow. And some of us are trying to pull out harvests that we ain't never reaped or sown into. See, when we think of serving, I want to be the harvest I'm believing to receive. Meaning this, do you want people to step into your vision up and down? Do you want people to come into your vision season ups and seasons outs and seasons ends and seasons you can't find me and seasons I'm over here and seasons over you No, you, you don't want that. So sow the harvest you desire to receive. Because whatever man sows, he has a legal right to receive. He begins to talk about in Hebrews chapter 11 that it takes faith to please, to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number six. In the shaping and molding, uh, he draws a lot of attention about the discomfort of being shaped and molded. When we're being shaped and molded, to be honest, we never stop being shaped and molded. I'm still being shaped and molded. Apostle is still being shaped and molded. We never stop being shaped and molded. But the reality of it is, is that we can't shape and mold ourselves. 
God's going to bring men, women into your life to help shape you, to help mold you. I was having a counseling session not long ago, and I just, I thank the individual that I was having a session with. I said, because in today's society, pastors don't really get to pastor. They get to share messages across the pulpit, but they don't get to pastor. Meaning this, you really don't get to do life with people where they come and say, Pastor, here's what I'm thinking. I need your wisdom on this. Give me your counsel. What do you think I should do? A lot of times you just get an email that says, hey, I decided to do this. God bless you. And you're like, hey, that's okay. It's fine. I mean, your life, do whatever you want to do with it. But you don't get the pastor, you know, in a lot of ways in, in this culture and in this society. And but when in getting shaped and being molded, what you'll find is God will bring those pieces to help shape and mold us. You know, I'll never forget I was the home that I'm living in now. Uh, I have a curved staircase and I love to I get my hands dirty and do a lot of labor. And, and Mr. Wallace, he helped me do a lot of the projects at my home. And, and uh, even Mrs. Wallace, she came and got her hands dirty a couple days. Uh, that Mrs. Wallace, not that one. <laughs> distinction nevertheless um you know and and i try to do as much as i can by myself you know use the gifts and talents that guys give me and i was re- trying to wrap my mind about this curved staircase i'm like how can i do this you know if it's a straight staircase i'm good to go i can rebuild a straight staircase but a curved staircase oh this presents a challenge so i realized i'm gonna have to hire a carpenter all right i'm gonna have to hire someone for this and I brought them, and I was able to connect with a guy who really God blessed me and saved tons of money. But nevertheless, he comes in, and as I saw him preparing to build it, and because the wood is curved, you would think that it's just one big piece of wood that's curved. But it's really thin, small, thin pieces, and it's probably like about 50 of them that make up just the one banister. It's amazing. And they utilize these contraptments at the end of every step. You remember seeing the contraptments? It was like these metal harnesses, kind of like something you would see off of one of the Saw movies. You know, these metal contraptments. It was crazy. On the edge of every step, and they would take this wood, and they would put it in uh, piece by piece. And after they put it in piece by piece, they would put this material over, this, this like liquid material over the wood, and then they would set it for days in order for the, the wood to take on the mold or to take on the shape. And God began to show me how, even with us, how he makes us, how he takes time to set us, for us to actually bend and to flex, to be what God has called me to be. And they use these contraptments, watch this, to harness the resistance. Because the wood don't want to be shaped. The wood don't want to change. The wood don't want to conform. The wood don't want to change their way of living. The wood don't want to change their lifestyle. The wood don't want to be accountable. The wood don't want to be friendly and walk in love and walk in forgiveness and kindness. And it showed me how those harnesses and God was revealing unto me, that's what apostles, pastors, and teachers are called to do in the lives of God's people, to help be a harness, just to help shape. They're not God, they're not called to be the wood they're just called to be the harness that holds the wood in its place so that God can give the wood its shape so God will bring gifts into your life to help give you your shape let's look at this let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 7 to 15 Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 is something I don't really preach much about within our local church. It's, it's a little uncomfortable, but what if I was out at a different church, it's a little more comfortable to, to preach these verses of Scripture. But in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number in 15 through 17, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15 through 17, watch this. It says, and I will give you shepherds according to my heart. Shepherds symbolizing, I'm going to give you pastors. I'm going to give you leadership according to whose heart? But what is that shepherd to, 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 uh, to us? That shepherd is what? It's a gift. See, I, sometimes I, I talk with individuals like, well, I, 
I want to go over here, and I like the church over here, and I like the singing over here, but I like the children's department over here, but I like the youth department over here, and I, like, and I think I'm going to go over here for this season. And I'm like, you don't have a pastor. And there's so many walking around, there's no pastor in their life. God never says that, okay, you're going to go find a shepherd that agrees with you. He says, no, I'm going to give you a shepherd. And what happens when you connect with the shepherd that God brings into your life, here's what that shepherd's going to do. He says this, he says, and he will feed you. This is why during the altar calls, we always utilize if you sense that God is leading you. There's some churches that really push, you got to have a church home. You better have a church home. Come join. Be a part of our church home. I don't want you to just be a part of our church. I, you, I need you to know that God's planted you here. And what you'll find when you're in a place that God has planted you, the seed of the word of God will be brought forth that ministers life to you. And not only does it minister life, but God will speak through that man or woman, especially if he or she is led by the Spirit of God. He will speak expressly to the issues you're dealing with, to the problems that you're dealing with. The Spirit of God will give the answers that you need for where you are in life. Because he places an anointing on that shepherd to feed those who are drawn to them. I stand in amazement many times on Sundays. People come and say, that was exactly what I needed. I was just, you were in my kitchen last night. We were just talking about that. Who can synchronize that other than the Spirit of God? And so there are people that God will bring in your life. You have to see them the right way. This is why it's hard to preach this here, you know, because it's the church I'm at. So if I was at another church, I could go in on this point, like really hard. But I got to walk on eggshells a little bit, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, but see them in the right way. Because here's what happens. He says this. They will feed you with what? With knowledge and understanding. Verse number 16. Then it will come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord. Then it'll come to pass when you're multiplied and increased. It'll come to pass that you're multiplied and increased. The word that comes through that shepherd has the assignment to multiply and increase in your life if you receive the word from whatever shepherd God's called you to. We were in prayer on uh, Wednesday. And while we were praying, we talked about Acts chapter 12 while they were praying sudden manifestations happening. And one of the declarations that I, one of the declarations that I always pray concerning the ministry is that God, those that you draw into this house, let a signature stamp of the blessing rest on their house of increase. Let the increase be a testament and a telltale sign of the divine joining to this work. And at the end of prayer, a gentleman walks in who's been coming here for about a month and a half. And he says, since I've been coming here, God has been increasing my life. And today I got the greatest news I ever received. He won the St. Jude house that was worth $775,000. I'm not going to tell you what else he said, but I don't care about the house. All I'm focused on is God confirming his word. That when people who are called to this house, that the anointing that's on this house, they experience the increase of the blessing flowing. Amen. And it was a confirmation of that word, just like we said it in so many ways. Because while we were praying, <laughs> this happens in his life. And he was just driving to go share the news with somebody else that it just happened. And he saw people, cars in the parking lot. He said, I got to go share it with my church family because my life is changing. See, God will cause that grace to flow. 
And I don't know where all God will lead you. I don't know where all God will take you. But here's what I would challenge you. When God sets a man or woman of God in your life, you got to set your heart to receive from him. And sometimes familiarity can breed contentment. We can become so close to people that we no longer see them in the same light. So we have to fight against that. I have to fight against that with apostle. I had to repent before God because I would just come on Tuesday nights because that's what I do. I go to Bible study on Tuesday nights. That's just what I do. But I wasn't coming in. God, speak through the man of God for me tonight. Speak a word through his mouth. I'm coming in with expectation to hear the undaughterated words of truth. Lord, cause a rhema word to be carved out of his message that ministers to me right where I am. I have to challenge myself to not just see him as my golf buddy. I can't just see him as my boss. I can't just see him as my friend. I can't just see him as my father. I have to keep a degree of distance. I have to keep a degree of reverence and honor. And there are times in our conversations I say, okay, is this apostle talking or is this dad talking? I need to know because if it's apostle, I'm hearkening unto this word. If it's a dad word, we can talk about it a little bit. But if it's the mouth of my apostle, I'm going to yield to that. Whether I agree, disagree, don't like it, don't want to do it, do like it, do want to do it. If you're speaking this as a man of God, I need to know because I'm going to hearken into that word. Because I trust the word in my apostle's mouth. Hmm, okay, let's keep going. Second Kings chapter 2, verse number 14, we see this example. We got to get ready to wind this thing down. We see this example of Elijah. You can just write that reference of scripture down. You don't have to turn there. But basically, Elijah crosses over the water. And, he, and, and he, 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 I think he throws down his mantle or something on the water. And the water opens up for Elijah and Elisha to walk back on dry land. And when Elisha returns, he's no longer with Elijah. But he follows the same what? He traces the same pattern throws the coat down and I love what he says he says this he said where is the Lord God of Elijah and when he makes that declaration the waters whoosh they open up and he walks on dry land and the water parts and so in all of our lives what we'll find is that God will bring Elijah's to us And whatever Elijah, I want to encourage you, whatever Elijah God brings to you to honor them as an Elijah, see them as an Elijah, hear them as an Elijah, receive from them as an Elijah because there's victory in their mouth for you. There's knowledge in their mouth for you as we just read in Jeremiah. There's understanding in their mouth for you. But not only that, what's in their mouth is going to cause you to multiply and it's going to cause you to increase. I'm going to leave you with this point. When we submit to being molded, it prepares us not just for the present, but it prepares us for things to come. You know, in every... Let me retract that statement. Throughout the scripture, you find a symmetry of a correlation of great people being used but the need of molding to take place in those in their lives there was a molding that took place in Esther's life through her uncle Mordecai it was a molding that took place in Elisha's life through Elijah it was a molding that took place in Joshua's life through Moses Joshua walked with Moses for over 40 years before he stepped into being, being the leader over the children of Israel The disciples were molded by Jesus. You see, in the life of Paul, he was molded in many ways by Barnabas. You see, the life of Timothy, he was molded by Paul. Peter was molded by Jesus. God didn't call us to mold ourselves. We're not bad enough. We're not strong enough. We're not wise enough. We're not smart enough. We're not equipped enough to mold ourselves. But God is going to bless us and grace us with gifts that he brings across our paths to mold us. And that molding is not just for the day, that molding is for things to come. Why do I have to keep my mind 
forward or my thoughts and vision forward focused instead of current focus. I have to stay forward focused. Reason being is because sometimes I'm being molded for things that I may not even experience for five years from now. But if I get locked into the moment, I'm just thinking about how does this apply to today? It's almost like the movie The Karate Kid. If you remember that movie, he's like, wax on, wax off. And he's like, listen, I need something real. I want to learn how to fight. I don't see how wax on, wax off is going to help me defend myself. And it wasn't until he got into that ring and he started to do those moves, he realized he was training them all along. And I'm telling you, God has been training you all along. And for some, there may have been a resistance. For some, there may have been a reluctancy to say, you know what, this is hard, or I'm in and out of the training. I challenge you tonight, encourage you to stay under that. Because everything that God is depositing in you, there are times where you're going to need it. You know, I'll never forget, I, at one point in time when I was younger in, in the Lord, godly, I've been, I've been doing this a long time. It may not seem like it, but I have. I'm, I'm, I'm coming up on almost 20 years of ministry. 20 years. Can you believe it? 20 years. Man, that's a long time. And uh, but when I was younger, I never forget, and I shared this story before, having a, uh, uh, in need of a root canal. My mouth, I needed a root canal. And typically that comes, you know what I mean, where there might be a crack in the tooth or some other issues there, and I had a crack in my tooth. And in the wintertime, if you have a cracked tooth or a chipped tooth that is in need of attention, that cold air, when it hits your mouth, you talk about pain. You ain't met pain until you had to deal with one of these things. I'm telling you, just one gust of wind to have you balled up in the bed, you know, sobbing and crying, it was excruciating. And I'll never forget, I'm dealing with this at one of the times when Apostle was away in, in, in Nigeria ministering. And I had to share that Sunday morning. And I said, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to stand here and minister. Everything in me said I need to call a replacement because I'm not going to make it. I couldn't open my mouth. So I came to service just trusting God. And I spoke with Apostle. And he said, son, the anointing of God is going to meet you when you step on that platform. Well, I didn't reach the platform yet. I was still in the pews. So, I mean, I didn't open my mouth and worship. But kind of like when Jesus went to the cross, he didn't open his mouth. That was me that morning, all right? I wasn't that expressive in worship. I had some things going on. And I'll never forget, I got up that platform, and boom, sure enough, the anointing of God hit my body. I was able to preach and minister the word and not feel an ounce of pain. Not an ounce of agony and God's presence showed up and the word went forth and lives were impacted and lives were touched. Only to find out when I got back home that the high was over and the pains returned. You know, I thought I was cool. I thought, man, I had a miracle. Something happened. I opened my mouth when I got home like, woof. No, I didn't. <laughs> I don't know if my faith shifted or what, but I had to eventually go get that procedure. But here's the thing that stuck with me. And everywhere I go, a few months ago, my body just wrecked with pain. It took every ounce of energy in me to get up to use the restroom. I said, I definitely got to call off. But I was reminded of that moment. I said, you know what? I'm not calling off. God's anointing is going to meet me. I woke up feeling fresh and renewed. I was able to minister. His anointing met me. And see, that's something wherever I go, I'll always take that with me. Whenever my body is wrecked with pain, I'm never going to call off because I know his anointing is going to meet me. But had I called off, I would have never experienced that. It'd never be a part of my story. I'm sharing that because there are things in your journey. God is just trying to make it a part of your story because there's going to be places you go. You're going to need to pull on that database. I can tell you story after story, but I'm going to stop right here tonight because I believe that God is building something in you. I believe that God is is, 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 is establishing your footsteps and leading you in a way to be fruitful in this season and in this hour. Listen, God needs our hands. You know, some people say, well, God is in control and God can do all things. That's not true. God needs us. He needs us to be the salt and light of the earth. I was reminded in the message today, I was listening to Dr. Bill Winston, and he was talking about the line that was divided. 
in Genesis chapter 1, and I've never seen it like this, where he says in Genesis chapter 1, I believe it's verse number uh, 26, he says, and let them have dominion over the birds of the sea, over the fish of the, over the, of the, over the, fish of the sea and the birds of the air. He set a line of division. I'm not having dominion over this. Man has dominion over this. I thought, wow, how encouraging is that to know? And we have to be reminded of that. Amen. And so let's pray as we prepare to dismiss. Father, we thank you once again for your grace. We thank you for your spirit, for your anointing. I thank you for the seed of the word that was planted tonight. I believe on good ground. And I thank you, Father God, that we all who are here have taken it upon ourselves to come and learn of you. And I thank you that the seeds that were sown tonight brought our hearts to a place of encouragement. I pray that it brought our hearts to a place of reflection, to look in the mirror, not from a place of condemnation, but to look in the mirror from a place of encouragement, encouraged in areas where we may need to be molded, areas where we can see ourselves and say, I'm still growing in that. God, help me become more faithful. God, help me become more committed. God, help me to press when I feel like I can't press anymore. God, I thank you that you're dealing with all of our hearts as individuals because the truth be told, we're all appointed for something. We're all appointed in a role that you have cast for us that play a part in your story that you're creating. We're so honored to be a part of that. And I think that as we delight ourselves in you, we, we will experience our heart's desires. And we know that the more synchronized our hearts come with your heart, that the more we will, you, we will experience the unity of oneness of our hearts being manifested, that truly that's when we find your will becoming our will. And so, Father, I just declare your grace over us tonight. May the Lord continue to bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You are dismissed. God bless you. Amen. Well.